5 ways to cut your bunker bill. This is particularly relevant with IMO 2020 just around the corner. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Everybody wants ways to save. Invest in a capital expense now to save on continuing expenses later. The most productive investment is always in your bunker bill. We so often see the argument that even saving 1-2% to in your fuel consumption can very quickly pay back the price of whatever your capital investment was for that. That's where engineers come in very handy to work out the cost-benefit ratio for that. But this is particularly relevant with IMO 2020 and uncertain fuel prices just around the corner. So today we're going to address both the concerns of IMO 2020 and five potential strategies that you can use to reduce your fuel consumption. So a quick recap of IMO 2020. On January 1st, 2020, the IMO severely reduces sulfur emissions permitted for every single vessel in the world or at least those operating under the IMO, which is every commercial vessel traveling internationally. Sitting happy here in 2019, the IMO used to allow vessels to emit up to 3.5% SOX emissions. That is over with. Now it's going to be down to just 0.5% SOX emissions. The biggest difference here is that it used to be that you could meet that 3.5% emissions and still burn cheap HFO cheap heavy fuel oil. Not so much anymore. Now with the 0.5% rule, your only two options are to install an exhaust gas scrubber or to switch over to burning low sulfur fuel. Most of the ships have not installed exhaust gas scrubbers. So we're expecting to see the vast majority of the ships in the world suddenly putting in orders for low sulfur fuel. Here's the catch. Low sulfur fuel is really a blend of heavy fuel oil and diesel fuel that's had its sulfur stripped out. It's mostly diesel fuel. The huge majority of the ships in the world that used to just be placing orders for heavy fuel oil are now suddenly going to be placing orders for diesel. The same diesel that all the trucks on the highways buy, the same diesel that all of the ships in the inland marine world order. Now, granted, that diesel gets stamped under different names, but if you track it back to the refinery, it's essentially coming out as the same product, which means that we're going to see a huge increase in demand from the refineries for diesel oil. Well, when refineries see a huge increase in demand, they say it's time to raise the price. We're talking 50,000 ships is the approximate number of ships traveling internationally. Now, how many of those are going to need to place orders for low sulfur fuel compared to how many have actually got exhaust gas scrubbers? We're not entirely sure. But even if it's only half, huge increase in demand for diesel oil. So you can expect massive price fluctuations. It's going to be a pretty uncertain time for diesel prices starting January 1st. Well, what can you do about it? Not pay for diesel oil? Um, not likely, unless you like turning your ship into a paperweight. In terms of real solutions, here are five practical long-term strategies that you can use to reduce your fuel consumption to help offset that increase in fuel prices. The first thing you can do is optimize your stability. If you have an older vessel, you might be hampered with minimum weight requirements due to stability reasons. If your stability booklet mentions any fixed ballast in it, or requires minimum tank levels in the ballast tanks or the fuel tanks, this is particularly you. But the goal behind those restrictions, it's not really weight. Ultimately, they want to keep down the center of gravity on your boat and maintain a minimum safe stability. Well, adding weight is the cheap way to do it. There are better ways to achieve that stability requirement. Instead of adding all of that unnecessary weight, you could instead install a weighted skeg. Think of the fin keels that you see on sailboats, but not nearly as deep and made of steel or aluminum, depending on your hull. And the trick to this is that the lower the skeg sits below your hull, the less weight required to achieve the same stability as you had before. The lower you want to go, the less weight, the better your fuel consumption gets. Even better though, that skeg acts just like the fin keel on a sailboat. 
it improves your vessel's churning capabilities. Now, skegs do require modifications to your hull, so we are talking about associated dry docking and renewal of your stability documents. DMS can walk you through the entire process though, and the great part is that you get more than just fuel consumption, but you also get improved maneuvering capabilities, and you get new life for your vessel's stability. Instead of having this continually slow march of stability decay, you're actually going to regain lost capability in terms of stability. And we can put in additional capabilities and additional options for future adjustments to your vessel stability. All of that comes from one weighted skeg. Number two, optimize for total transport efficiency. Sometimes heavy cargoes are not the best cargoes. Granted, no one wants to see ships travel half empty, but we all know that ships burn less fuel when they travel with less cargo. A light ship is a fast ship. This is where we need to ask the smart question. Which is more important, lots of cargo or getting the best profit from the ship? For some ships, those two may not be the same answer. There might be an optimum point with a slightly less cargo less overall weight that reduces the fuel consumption, reduced fuel consumption, reduces the operating costs for the ship, and ultimately means more profit for that ship. This whole thing feeds into the idea of a ship transport factor. We examine the utilization of a ship on a specific route to determine the net benefit compared to cost. Higher transport factor makes for a better utilized ship. Now that's easy to describe, harder to implement. Everything hinges on the details, and that's specific to each ship and each route. Take an example of a ship working on a regular route transporting containers for a fixed price per ton. Okay, sounds pretty simple, right? Uh-uh. Factors to consider for that would include your fixed costs, you've got your crew, your maintenance, your victuals. Now we also consider the variable costs. You've got your fuel consumption, how it varies with the draft of the ship, how it varies with the sea state that you're driving through. Then we also have to consider the revenue from the cargo. And then we also have to consider a host of other minor factors. Thankfully though, when you're asking, how much is this going to cost me? Compared to the cost of say, cutting holes in your ship and bolting new things on and making vessel modifications, these optimization efforts involve very little risk and very minimal cost. It's a paper exercise. There's no actual modifications to the vessel. Number three optimize your propeller. Rather than going with your standard stock propeller that you already have, you can always order one that gets customized to your exact vessel. This would involve a CFD and possibly towing tank testing even to understand the local flow conditions around the propeller for your exact ship. The propeller designer would then tweak the blade design to specifically match the flow patterns on your ship. This is what we would call a wake adapted propeller. Of course, to get the benefit of that, that does mean you have to buy a whole new propeller and install it. Ouch, no small expense. This option doesn't really pay off unless you definitely know that your current propeller suffers from extreme inefficiency or operates outside of its original design condition. So I would be very cautious about implementing this option, but if you know that your current propeller is suffering or if you're already planning to replace your propeller, then sure. I would go for the wake adapted propeller and get that little extra percentage because you have to remember everything is going through the propeller in terms of your power. So don't neglect getting every little peak efficiency you can out of that propeller. Number four, adding a prop assistant. Even the best propellers cap out near 65 to 72% efficiency. But why stop there? Add in a prop assistant to boost it another few percent. The market offers a host of devices to boost your propeller efficiency, and most of these devices can even be added as a retrofit. Looking at the list, you'll notice that everything claims improvements in the range of 2-5%, to which definitely helps your fuel budget. But the real magic happens if you start to combine multiple devices together. The cumulative effects cut your fuel budget by 6 to almost 14% stacking up to huge fuel savings. Now this does come with a note of caution because combinations of propeller devices don't automatically mean equivalent fuel savings. It depends on the principles behind each device and how the devices interact with each other. DMS would 
definitely recommend CFD modeling to confirm fuel to savings if you're going to combine multiple devices before you invest in any modifications. Number five. Last but not least, this is a special tip to everyone working with barges. Ditch those chunky skegs. Conventional barge skegs account for 20 to 30% of the total barge resistance. This is completely ridiculous for an appendage whose only job is to help the barge tow in a straight line. In any conventional ship, appendages only add 5 to 10% to the total resistance. Conventional skegs on a barge suffer from bad design, plain and simple. The better alternative is high lift skegs. One example would be the brand name Hydrolift by Nautican. These high lift skegs use thin lifting foils to give you the same directional stability, but with much less resistance. Nautican claims 35 to 50% reduction in resistance. Many modern barges install them from day one. Definitely worth investigating. There are only two exceptions to the high lift skegs that I would mention. You want to keep the existing skegs if they are watertight and provide buoyancy, or if they function as part of an ATB ladder system. In that case, the most important feature of those skegs is their structural connection, rather than their directional stability. So that was it. Five strategies to tackle the problem of rising fuel prices. Yes, these require capital investment, but the intent is to get a larger payoff with the increased fuel savings. And no matter what you decide, taking this back to IMO 2020, remember that it demands action. The biggest danger of IMO 2020 lies in just ignoring it. Regulations push us forward, requiring change. We can't stop it. We can't just ignore it. But we do control the mechanism of that change. We can decide what the future of 2020 will involve. We can decide that it will just be reacting to uncertain fuel prices, or we can decide that it will be the year that we take action and decide on a lower fuel bill. I hope that 2020 is a good year for you. Thank you very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Engineers should be overpriced, inaccessible, boring. Boy, were they wrong. If you want to have an accessible engineer to work with, click that subscribe button to stay tuned for more videos. And did you know that as a professional engineer, I do more than just videos? Check out the website to find out what I can do to make your project easier.